Hi, I'm Maggie Woodley from Redhead Art, and this is Ellie. Hi. This is Chaos. Yeah. Um, we're here today for a very special hangout. Normally, you see us crafting and sharing all sorts of craft ideas. Today, we wanted to share with you our foraging experiences. Basically, it's autumn or fall here in the UK, and um, a few of us bloggers love going out to forage. And basically, as Liz Burton put it the other day, is it's free food. So, what free food can you find out there, and then come home and make something? And the reason I like foraging is because I like to be really thrifty and I like to be really environmental. So a lot of my crafts are all about recycling and what I love about foraging is that you're sort of taking what nature has to offer. Um, for that reason, I kind of extend foraging a little bit with my kids. Um, we live in, in an urban environment and for me it's extended to the point where if you see a neighbour's garden with a huge apple tree where the apples are just falling off and rotting, I think it's really good to go and ask and say, would you mind if we pick some of the apples? So it's sort of extending the, the concept of foraging and um, waste not, want not, um, to the urban environment as well. Nice thing to do there, though, is when you do forage the bits and pieces, if you're making a thing, is to bring some fruit fruits. Yes, really good idea. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and that sort of kind of also encourages that sort of neighbourliness, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, no, it's really good. Um, so for us, I'm going to kick off really quickly. Um, Ali and I live in the same area, so clearly we forage the same sort of thing, <laughs> uh, which is mainly um, in our area there's some black trees and some plums. Um, and I love foraging with the kids uh, because it teaches them to take a look around, see what we've got, learn a little bit about nature. We can talk about what they can touch and can't touch. I mean, I'd love to go mushroom hunting, but I just don't do it. So that's sort of an example where you have to be really, really careful. So you need to know what you're picking. Um, but, you know, with the kids, it's really easy. We go armed with some buckets into areas that we know. Um, I think foraging is tricky to stumble upon things if you haven't got things to collect in. You do need to have something to collect in with us as these little buckets and yeah. it lends us. Um, we talk about with the kids about putting on um, things that cover your arms and your legs so that for example, especially blackberries yeah. so that you don't get prickled. And, and there's also metals. generally there's loads of nettles as well. So yeah. So it's, it's, it's I guess it's, so for us foraging is we tend to go back to known areas that we know and that we know has certain things that we can pick and, and, and collect. Um, we very rarely forage where we stumble upon things just to have anything to collect. So very quickly, because I don't want to bore everyone, um, the things we like making is uh, blackberry jam. Um, this one's blackberry apple. It's quite well, you can see it not running. Um, but here's another one which is actually cherry jam that we did in Austria. So I mean, different countries will have different things that you can pick. And in Austria also we found some um, apricots, so we made apricot jam. Um, jam making is a great foraging um, thing. I know lots of people are really scared of jam making because they want to get it perfect, they want to get a perfect consistency and it really worries them and they're like, oh, I can never get it right. But you know, um, a friend of mine in, in North London, she, she just makes it and she just goes, you know what, if it's runny, I don't care, it still tastes good. And I think that's the right attitude to have. Oh, I think it's too, yeah, you eat right. it with yogurt, yeah, she does actually, she has it with yogurt. And I think that's really the, exactly the right attitude, is just have a go. And generally with, with uh, making jam, um, there's instructions on the uh, jam sugar, so you need the special jam sugar that's got pectin in it. Just follow those instructions. It's usually something like ratio of uh, weight one to one. So one, if you've got 100 grams of fruit, you use 100 grams of sugar, and then off you go. I mean, yes, you can be really clever and get the boiling point right and worry about whether it's sticky enough or not, but I just think it's just have a go, make it. And actually, the more you make it, the, the more you learn. And actually, this year, I'm really pleased with our blackberry, and that is sweet. It's good, well. isn't it? Yeah. Yes, I still owe you one, don't yeah. I? <laughs> the other thing we like doing with blackberries is um, uh, making cakes. So I've got a cake at home. We make a cake called, uh, we call it the forager's cake. And the reason I call it forager's cake is because you can put any fruit on it. It's a very Austrian recipe. Um, the Austrians like having lots of fruit cake. And basically, it's really easy. You take eggs. Uh, we usually take three, but you can take four or two or whatever. You weigh the eggs. And then you use equal measures. So if my eggs, usually two eggs, weigh around 150 to 170 grams. Um, I just know this. In the shells. In their shells. You weigh them in their shells. And then you use the same weight, 170 grams of self-raising flour, 170 grams of butter, and 170 grams of sugar. And then you mix it all up, put it in a tray, pop your fruit on top, whatever it is, blackberries, plums, apples, pears, uh, apricots. Those are really nice fruits to put on. Pop it in the oven. Job done. Really nice. And we made them as cupcakes or cakes. So I'm going to hand over to Ali now, Ali Hodge, yep. and then you can come back at the end so it's a bit more variety. 
Um, those are just our ideas. And Ali, over to you. Hello. Um, I've been quarantined about three years um, with the kids. Um, we started off in a local farmer's field, just picking blackberries and sloes, crab apples, and elderberries. Um, it was a really abundant year. And when I got home, I just had this idea in my head about um, making them for a family. Um, and ever since then, every year, I give a hamper as Christmas presents. So starting from June, July, I start picking stuff to make into jams, jellies. Um, I actually made some fruit beaner. It was meant to be jelly. And I, um, I boiled up the fruit. And I put it in. I haven't got the sound off. I've got this thing for the jelly stand, and that stands on your worktop. And you have this bag. It's in the wash at the moment. And you pour the fruit in, and you have um, a container underneath. You leave that overnight, and all the uh, juices run through. And the idea is not to touch the bag, otherwise the jelly goes cloudy. The next day, I went to measure out my sugar. And instead of waiting for the uh, the juice to boil up so I can have the sugar, I bunged it straight in. <laughs> but um, it means I can use it as a cordial. So I carried on boiling it, and um, I put some brandy in as well. That helps preserve it, and it gives a bit of um, kick to it. But um, I just dilute that, and the kids like that. Um, I make loads of this, and I don't have to buy juice for months and months because it's really concentrated. Um, going back to this, last year um, I picked a load of meadowsweet. Um, meadowsweet is a herb that you find in um, by rivers and quite marshy areas. It's got like um, a dark green and uh, dark green leaf, and when you touch it, it smells like germline. And the flowers come out about July time. Um, this one's dried, um, and it. It smells like almonds. It's really heavenly scent, and it's just really intoxicating. And um, I've dried this, and I tend to make little herb bags, and I hang them around the house. Can you hold it's it up for screen a bit more, Ali, so we can see it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I have, I have right. okay, That's perfect. it dried. It, it's like a fluffy herb. It's quite tall, and it grows on mass. And um, I just wait until the flower's just about to come out, because that's when the best time to um, pick it. Um, and then I dry it upside down. Um, you can just see that's when they're just starting to where's uh, just starting to come out. And this is like the fluffy bit when they're starting to flower. Um, and you can use that in, um, like I said, with the fruit beaner. Um, it's very good for people who've got muscle aches, um, arthritis, and things like that. So you can make it into a syrup. Or you can do like I did and add it to the fruit bean list. Um, like I said, I keep I make that into little sachets and hang around them. It's good for getting rid of flies. In medieval times, it was used as a strewing herb, so it'd be put on the floor and left all day. And then at the end of the day, it would be swept up, um, and that kept flies and insects out of the house. Um, right. Um, going back to what Maggie said about urban foraging, I live in a town. Um, and it wasn't until I started foraging and started reading books that I realised a lot of what we have around here is, you know, within walking distance. Um, uh, and it gets my kids noticing things a lot now. And, you know, I can go past a flower or, or later on in the year a berry. And the kids say, oh, yeah, that's sloes, that's um, elderberries. And they remember when it's the best time to pick things. Um, and really eager. Um, we've got elderberries out there at the moment, which been the girls picked. And it was just a five minute journey on the way from school. They've been there, and every day the girls go, We've got to pick them, and we've got to pick them. Um, and so we, we picked them, um, and I'm going to make them into jelly. <laughs> so I remember to have the sugar at the right time. Um, um, but um, I've got a mental map in my head of all the places around town. Um, we do go on little treks on a Sunday and we go right let's go this way and then we go back a few days later if there's things of interest to um, pick. Um, it was this year actually um, when uh, Liz showed, uh, did a blog about um, her cherries 
uh, we got loads of cherry trees around here, and I had it in my head they were poisonous. <laughs> I thought all cherry trees. <laughs> and um, looking in my foraging book, uh, and read up about those two types of cherries, sweet and sour, and it was amazing. And for years, I've been going, don't touch those cherries, you can't eat them. Um, and we had a ball this year. We actually found lots and lots of cherry trees. And it's amazing that we just blind walk past something for 10 years and not realizing there's something on your doorstep you could have for free. So it's great to know that other people out there are doing the same thing as you. And you open your eyes to things. Um, going on um, also, talking about... Um, picking things from other people's gardens. Um, it's also um, uh, good to know that some places when you're, um, particularly if it's on private land or um, sorry, public land, you don't have the right of way to pick things, uh, especially if it's on council land, uh, national trust uh, and woodland trust. They do have bylaws, so it's worth ringing up in advance and saying I'm going to you know, um, forage in this area, is it okay? Um, um, last year, I made the mistake of going to the golf course and they've got a beautiful uh, line of rose hips and I was happily helping myself. And this lady came out of the tea room she said, um, do you mind? You could have asked. And I went, oh, okay. And I just went, trundled off. It's very embarrassing, but um, I did get some roses out of them. <laughs> Um, so yeah, these are dried and there's loads of ways you can dry them. Um, I am thinking of getting a dehyd dehydrator. Um, these take a very long time to dry in the oven and you have to have a low oven. And my oven is rubbish, so to have it on for quite a long time. But it is worth it. Um, I did read that you meant to separate them, but I was told by a forager friend who actually does foraging for a living. You don't have to. Um, because when uh, I use this for tea, and I just boil them in um, uh, in a teapot and stir them for a few minutes, and then I pour it for a tea strainer. So it doesn't matter if you saw the little fuzzy hairs. Um, see that the little fuzzy hairs, um, which can tickle the back of your throat. Um, when you were a kid, you probably um, squeezed the rose hips when they were just picked up through and put them down people's back switching powder. Well, they can get caught in the back of the throat if you're not careful. But um, they dry really easily. And I, I, I don't know, I've probably got about a couple of teaspoons in there in the tea. Um, and I got loads from last year from my golf course foraging. <laughs> um, we go all over the place, um, to tell you the truth. And we've got in the habit of if we're going to walk to take stuff with us. Um, and my kids love it, and they love the fact that we're getting something out of going somewhere as opposed to just walking. We are actively looking for something, and they come home with the leaves and you know draw around the leaves and they note what kind of flower it is and that kind of thing. Anyway, I'm waffling, so I'm going to move on to Anthea. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Ali. Um, I've, I actually can't, I didn't realise this until I was talking, but I, I was I come from a kind of a family of foragers, um, and I was um, I'm a seventies girl. Um, when I grew up, my mum used to make loads of things. She used to take us out, she used to pick mushrooms, wild garlic. Um, she used to make our make medicine, um, and that came from my nan. And as it turns out, it came from my my great grandmother. And my great -grand grandmother was the herbalist. Um, in a little Welsh mining village. So historically we have quite a lot of things. Um, and what's really nice is it's kind of come around again. I've never not foraged at all, but obviously um, you kind of get caught up in work and you do less. You know, one of the things I've always made is slow gin and damson gin because they're just very easy kind of to find in most towns and places. And you can go walking, pick them, bung them in some gin or, or even some vodka, leave it and it, it, it's add a bit of sugar and it, it's you're sorted. Um, what I've started doing with my girls, and I did it young, is that we happen to have kind of apple trees and elderflowers um, in our garden. So I used to involve my girls in picking those, um, and they're still now, even now, they're not allowed. We have raspberry bushes. None of the girls, and I have three, are allowed to go into the garden and pick anything without asking me. Even though that they know that they're allowed to, they always come and ask if they can go and get a bowl, and they can kind of pick things. So they're allowed to do that with the raspberries. In fact, any vegetable we grow. Um, and it's the same with flowers as well, because some flowers um, are a little bit poisonous and cause rashes and things. So we've 
And when they were young, because in case you didn't know, I have three girls that are very close in age. So I have um, six-year-old twins, and well, she's now just turned eight, and my twins are about to turn seven. So there's kind of like a year between them. So going out with three of them when they were young was kind of foraging was a bit of a scary thing. So we kept it close house and now we can do it when we go out and it's it's important now when we go out because they, they kind of like it as well. We're, we're a bit of a berry family um, and we kind of keep the elderflower, elderberry tree I absolutely love and we do this, I've been doing this, uh, one of the very easy things you can do, I don't know if you'll hear this, I don't know if you heard that big fizz and there's loads of bubbles coming up there now. This is really simple, oh god, sorry. Love it, love it. This is simple, simple. You need massive, big um, beer making plastic things. Bung in some lemons, bung in some sugar, bung in some elderflowers, leave it for a, a, whew, a week or so, decant it off, leave it, and you can drink it within a month. I mean, it's, I keep mine actually, I have, and it gets, to, it changes the older you get. So um, I make loads of this. Um, but then, of course, what you can then do with the um, oh, and if it doesn't if it doesn't fizz, so sometimes when you open it, if you put too many lemons in, it goes a bit like vinegar. But if it's flat, what you end up with is a cordial. And if it's flat, you can add a little bit more sugar, and sometimes it fizzes up again. Or you can just dilute it with tonic water um, or ordinary water, or you can use it in ice cream. But then, of course, they turn to elderberries. So you then get, you know, and these are elderflowers are, are and elderberry trees are everywhere. They're, they're, they're grown by the council. They're like weeds. So you often find them on just walkways. So I have certain spots locally that I go to. It's very good elderberries for making a cough syrup. Now, I don't know if you're going to see this because it's very, very thick. Oh, let me move that. That's for later. <laughs> Where's my spoon? I had it all set up and then I just moved. This is a really, really thick. I did this last night. Um, woo, there we go. And you take a spoonful of this, here it comes. Yeah, that is just fantastic. It's boiled, um, so I stewed it in a little bit of water, not very much, just to cover it. Stewed the elderberries, crushed them up, put them through mis muslin, squeezed it out to get. I actually got an extra 50 mils last night, which was very exciting by squeezing it through. And then you put it back in the saucepan. And you cook it for another sort of 50 minutes, but with some cloves. And I put, I didn't have any star anise, but I put cloves, um, some ginger, um, black pepper, and some cinnamon sticks. And it makes this really thick, sweet, lovely cough mixture because elderberries have got lots of rich in vitamin C. They've got ox I can never say the antioxidants um, in as well, and you've got all the herbs and spices. So when you get a cold and flus, you just take you can take a spoonful of this before for kids when they wake up in the morning when they go to bed. But you can also this is lovely poured on ice cream. So if they don't like the idea of it off a spoon, you can kind of put it on their food. Um, as with all things, it's better if you kind of take it neat because you, you, it doesn't get kind of mixed up with other foods. But this is very simple. And my mum, I remember having this from my mum. Another way people do it as well is they kind of roast the elderberries and put that in the oven just to kind of concentrate the flavour before they stew it. Um, and you can also dry the elderberries, a bit like Ali was saying, if you dry the elderberries you've then got a constant supply. Then we've got the blackberries again, and again last night, I'm all for easy with all my kids, so this, yeah, it's just blackberry, and these were so sweet I didn't even need to add any sugar. So you just make it really simple, just pour it over, Ooh, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> yummy, yummy, yummy. That's my breakfast. But it's, oh, heaven, heaven. Yeah, just, and that's a tiny little, it was a little handful. So you don't need a lot, just a little handful of blackberries. So if you're out picking and you've got, make one of Maggie does those fantastic little paper bags that you can roll up by folding them in that she's got on her blog. Um, stick a load of blackberries, bring them back, stew them down. You can freeze it, keep it. Oh, on, on all kinds of things. Fresh and safe. Apples. I won't go on about what you can do with apples because there's so many recipes. One of the new things I found out, which I'm just trying, I'm going to make some apple cider vinegar. Very simple. Didn't know you can do that. You can do this all year round, and I just did this this morning. So this is basically, you just use the peel and the core. Yeah, let it go brown, which is good. You want it to go brown. And then you just put it in a, um, a glass jar, fill it up, and you can keep adding. So you just leave a gap if you've got a big jar. Put a muslin over the top, not the lid, because the lid will go rusty, and it will basically turn to vinegar. It'll go all cloudy and kind of um, mouldy. I'll let you know how I get on with that. And then you, s within about, I think it's a month, it said, you um, filter it off and then you put the lid on and you've got this amazing apple cider vinegar that you can use for all kinds of things. So I'm well chuffed about that. 
And then my other bit, which is very quickly, and then I'll go on, because we could go on forever about recipes, but this is why I've done the meringues, is because I'm into ice cream at the moment, and I had all these egg yolks, so I thought that was a good way to show you the lovely um, blackberry. But you don't need an ice cream maker to make, um, but in here is some, I've done, um, I did strawberries, because we were using the last of our strawberries, and if they're going, particularly if fruit's starting to go, and kids are a bit funny about it, eating strawberries and things when they're a bit mushy and stuff, you can bung it in ice cream. That's lavender. And he's talking about this asking your neighbours. And it's the same with this, actually. If you've got lots of people, and I do, I say, does anyone want to make scrumpy? Because we get lots of apple windfall and we end up composting it. So um, if you've got neighbours that have got apple trees or pear trees or you, you're walking down and they're on the floor, just pick them. You can make the apple vinegar. It doesn't matter if they're all bruised. Just use the peel. Um, lavender, that lavender, I've just got, f there's about 10 heads of lavender in it and you can still use it now even though they're just flowering so if you've got a neighbour with a massive lavender bush just ask if you can take some off they're, not, they're unlikely to say no because you're just taking a few little ones and you can make some fantastic you know a litre and a half of lavender vinegar so don't be frightened of asking because actually I would prefer somebody come and say can I have your windfall than for me to keep composting or actually we end up with so much that I end up taking it down to the skip you know because we have too much so so to make a point and kids if you're like me, because it's in our family, we do it. So you're passing things on. So if you involve your children now, it's a bit like me. I have memories of my mum doing it and my nan. And my mum has memories of her mum and her nan. So hopefully my kids will have the same thing. So when they get older, they'll do the, you know, they'll start looking and pass it on to their kids. Now I'm going to pass on to Liz, who's also got lots of lovely for and is an expert forager as well. Hello. Thanks. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, I think that's really important about passing on family traditions because if we don't do it, um, it's, it's going to be lost. So we obviously go out um, as a family on weekend walks and collect things and it's really great, you know, even in the spring when there's not much about, we're spotting, you know, where the apple blossom is uh, so we know that we can go back there later in the year and there'll be apple trees. There's, like, there's so many apple trees now this time of year in um, laybys at the side of the road because obviously people would have stopped in their car, ate an apple, chucked the core, and then sort of, you know, 10 years later, you've got a beautiful apple tree. So you don't have to live in the middle of the countryside to, to do your foraging. Um, I'm in a town as well, so um, a lot of my foraging is sort of fairly, fairly urban. But um, blackberries are probably the most common, common thing to forage, and especially if you're just starting out because they're really easily identifiable, um, so they're perfectly safe to do with the kids, apart from the prickles. Um, so we've made, um, we make cordial as well, just like everyone else. Um, and like Anthea was saying, I'm quite interested in the kind of herbal side of things and, and the natural, you know, what's good for you. Now elderberries are brilliant for you because not only are they full of vitamin C, but they've got a substance in called Sambucol, which is actually where Sambuca comes from. Um, but they've done some recent studies and that substance is supposed to be more effective at beating flu than the commercial drugs like Tamiflu and things like that. So it's a, it's a really good tonic to take and it's a really nice cordial so kids are quite happy just to, um, just to eat it, uh, just to drink it down. The other thing I do with blackberries is I make ooh, jelly. <laughs> um, and this is a really good recipe. It's really, really easy to make your own jelly. Um, and it's great because you can kind of dress it up and have it as a, you know, posh pudding or just a tea time dessert. Or if you put it in the little moulds, it goes in lunch boxes really nicely. So I tend to use, um, you get different sorts. You get leaf gelatin and a powdered sort. And you can obviously get vegetarian gelatin as well. So I tend to use the leaf Stuff, which is like this, it looks like a little bit of plastic um, and it's really simple, you just boil up your fruit with a bit of sugar, um, sugar and water, soak your gelatin till it goes all jelly, gelatinous, what's the word, gelatinous, um, squeeze that out, mix it round, pour it in a mould, put it in the fridge and that's it, job done. So that's a really simple way and especially I think a lot of children don't like um, the pips in blackberries. So that's a really good way of getting rid of the pips because you strain it off and then you've got something that's really smooth and um, easy to eat. And then this morning, I've, not, I've been busy this morning, 
we have a lot of cobnut trees near us. I don't know if you can see what does a cobnut look like. Um, they're basically hazelnuts. So at the moment they're fairly green on the trees and they're in these little sort of husky shells and then they will start falling off the tree and they just basically look like commercial hazelnuts. And these are really good if you find a tree because they're so simple to collect. They just fall onto the floor. The kids love it. You can literally scoop up, you know, carry a bag fulls of them. And they grow a lot in urban areas. They're quite a sort of municipal plant. A lot of councils use them. So you'll find them on streets, in residential streets. And you'll find them in, in woods and hedgerows and things like that. And one of the things I love to make is, let me see. Can you see this? Hang on, where are you going? Ooh. Uh, I can't bend my laptop over. I'm going to tip it up and probably throw it everywhere. So this is um, nut brittle, which is really easy to make. Yeah, I'll show you. Um, it's a really simple recipe because it's just two ingredients. It's just sugar and nuts. Um, and I like to put salt on it as well because I like the kind of salted caramel taste. So um, you have to crack all your nuts first, which is the laborious job. So sit there, crack your nuts open, <laughs> um, toast them in the oven. <laughs> I've got the giggles. Toast them in the oven, and then you just make up some caramel, which is literally just put some sugar in a saucepan, leave it alone, don't stir it, or you'll get all sticky. Wait till it melts into a brown caramel. Pour in the nuts, pour it out onto a sheet of greaseproof paper, and then it will set fairly instantly, and then you just smash it up. So it's a really nice like last minute gift to make if you're going around someone's house or something and um, you've got nothing in. All you need is sugar and nuts and that's it. Um, and that's it really. I'm going to eat it. I'm going to pass you back to who's next? Ali Clifford, I think. Amazing. Wow. We Amazing. Are, we are so good at making yeah. all those things. I'm so We're excited. in awe. Well done. I'm glad that the elderberry flowers are gone now. It's berries now, isn't it? Um, anyway, over to you. So, um, mine are fairly simple, sort of basic. Yours are amazing, guys. Um, we talked about this before, which is using up using up the blackberries um, to do a bit of tie dye. So uh, we what we did was uh, we were going away at the weekend, so we um, laid them all on a tray and froze them and used half of them for the dye and half for a crumble. Um, speaking of freezing, we had loads of plums and the same issue where we didn't have time to do anything with them. So um, what we what we do is, and again, you know, as you've all said, this is learned from my mum. This is out the freezer, so I'm going to go and put them back in. Really it's cold. cold. Really cold. Oops. I'll put it back. So um, I put them back in the okay, well. Carry on talking. <laughs> <laughs> so you basically you cut them in half, look for little wiggly worms because there's always little wiggly worms, um, and then you lay them all out and freeze them, and then you can just use them in the crumble. Um, you don't need to defrost them; you just put them underneath a uh, crumble mix to come in the oven. Um, the other thing was pears. Um, and I, I don't have any cake left because we ate it, but it makes an amazing cake. And sorry to show you photos of not real cake. Oops. There you go. Um, I so, have eaten this cake. Yeah, it's really <laughs> yummy. <laughs> it takes a while to bake, but um, you can see the layers of pears. So, um, yeah, I, I think um, everything's uh, been really interesting to listen to, and I hope you know, we've all picked some bits and pieces up. And, uh, I think um, Ali's thing about freezing is a really tip, good tip because I think the problem with this time of year that things are up, they're abundant, there's too yeah. much. I mean, um, Anthea tipped on it on how she has to throw so much of it away. Mm. Uh, I have a friend who lives in Kent and she brings me big bags full. And, you know, that is one way of doing it is you just freeze it. Or um, especially with things like apples, if you've got the time just to cook it down and then you've got apple puree that you can use later, just freeze it. Just get it cooked and out of the way so it doesn't go off. Um, it's the main thing. But I'm, I'm really inspired. Yes. Uh, I so need to go out and find some new things. Um, rose hips that Ali mentioned before as well, Ali Hodge, um, is something that I remember from my childhood. I love the idea how foraging is also a really good family activity and it's something that you do together and then you're passing on memories and um, you know things across the generations. I think that's so lovely. And I, mean, I know my kids will remember the blackberry picking and the apple picking yeah. and the plum picking. I just now, <laughs> now we need yeah. to go and find some elderberries and some rose hip and uh, the nuts, and nuts. Actually, Liz, I, I think we're going to go off and look in our common and see if there's some nuts. Um, 
we, we resigned ourselves to collecting them in my stepmother's garden, but I think finding them in nature is just so much more exciting. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I think we've talked a lot today, yeah. but uh, <laughs> hopefully it's all been really inspirational. It certainly has been for me. Thank you for coming, everyone, and um, hopefully see everyone again soon. So thank you, and bye-bye. Happy foraging. Bye. Bye. bye.